Okay. So, all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Joshua and Caleb, for the Lord. Believe in his name. Stone them. The esteem of Yehovah appeared in the tent of meeting before all the children of Israel. Uh oh, they're in trouble. Now, before we go on, I want to have a look at a psalm that kind of explains the situation which is going on here and explains the situation that I talked about at the end of the last part where people are in fellowships with people who don't really want to follow the word and it also explains situations when people live in families that really don't get the word they just you know just when you're surrounded by people who just don't get it basically Psalm 69, 5 to, uh, 5 to 21 says, O oh Elohim, you yourself know my foolishness, and my guilt has not been hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Master Yehovah Sebaot, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be humble because of me, O Elohim of Israel. Because I have borne reproach for your sake. We read, okay, for your sake later on when Moshe said that Yehovah was angry with him for the sake of the people. This is different. Okay, this is literally um, for Yehovah's sake, for the sake of Yehovah. Um, David is born reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me because this is what those people do. This is what they were doing with Joshua and Caleb. They were reproaching not, the, not them, but Yehovah ultimately, and the reproach that they had towards Yehovah fell on Joshua and Caleb, and it's the same for us when we speak the truth. Okay, those people who wish to hate and to reproach Yehovah, who he actually is and not who they imagine him to be, fall on us, and we get the brunt of it, basically, because we're there in the midst of them. So they hate him, it shows in their actions towards us. I wept in my soul with fasting and it became my reproach. And when I put on sackcloth, I became a proverb to them. And this is when your actions basically highlight to them the problems in their lives. When, they, when he's fasting and in sackcloth and ashes, he became a proverb to them, something that was speaking to them, so to speak. They saw from his actions that their actions were wrong. It became a reproach to him when he would fast before them. Okay, They hated Yehovah, so when they see you doing things to do with Yehovah, then it angers them. Okay? It becomes a reproach to them. They who sit in the gate talk about me, and I'm the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Yehovah, and at an acceptable time, O Elohim, in the greatness of your kindness, answer me in the truth of your deliverance. So he's calling on his name here amongst a load of people who do not understand his name, let alone believe in it. Rescue me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of deep waters. And this is exactly the situation, isn't it, that we find Joshua and Caleb in too. Let not a flood of waters overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, nor let the pit shut its mouth on me. Answer me, O Yehovah, for your kindness is good. According to the greatness of your compassion, turn to me. Do not hide your presence from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me speedily. Draw near to my soul. Redeem it. Ransom me because of my enemies. I find that a particularly interesting thing for David to ask for here. And when I was talking a couple of weeks ago about taking refuge in Yehovah and being protected by him, I gave the example of Yeshua. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's not an absolute guarantee in all circumstances that we will be safe from harm. You look at Stephen. You know, Stephen was stoned. Harm came to the apostles. Harm came to Yeshua. But... Yehovah has got the eternal perspective on it, hasn't he? If anything happens to us, he knows where we're going to end up. 
so for his righteous servants to die might be a terrible thing in the moment and it might be to us with our limited conception of life and you know the things that we're scared of that our lives are going to end but to him he knows that we're going to go and dwell in paradise so I find it interesting that what David says in the midst of all his enemies around him is he says draw near to my soul redeem it don't let the pit swallow me up he says ransom me because of my enemies because then if he is killed what's the worst that's going to happen he's going to wake up in paradise big deal you yourself know my reproach and my shame and my confusion my adversaries are all before you and Yehovah does know all of those things Reproach has broken my heart and I am sick. I looked for sympathy, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And there's nothing in his life that he can go to for any kind of comfort in this, because everything around him is alien. He's different from all these things, and when he's doing righteousness, it becomes a reproach to him. They gave me gold for my food and for my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. So we know, you know my reproach, my shame, and my confusion. We know that this is something that was fulfilled in Yeshua. And indeed, Yeshua experienced this to the ultimate level when he died on the cross. So Yehovah does appreciate those things. And it makes me think of this verse. It says, remember the former events of old time, Ail, and there is no one else, Elohim, and there is no one like me. So we think that we've got it bad here on the earth when we are being righteous and it becomes a reproach to us. Think about what it's like for Yehovah. You know, David's describing it as rescue me from this mire. I'm surrounded by all of this garbage. But Yehovah is so set apart from it all. He's surrounded constantly by people who do not know his name and in fact hate his name. And if they see the light, they choose the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. He's completely surrounded by evil. And he set things in motion in creation to bring to himself a people who choose him of their own free will. That's what he's done and that's what the end of this is going to be. And then Israel is going to be this light to the nations during the millennium. And he's going to draw all of the wicked of the nations to himself as well. Because they're going to see that light. They're going to see Yehovah's name and it's going to draw the people to him. And Yehovah said to Moshe, how long shall I be scorned by these people? Yehovah is being scorned here. How long shall I not be trusted by them? Okay, we looked at trusting in his name with all the signs which I've done in their midst. And this trust is intrinsically linked to believing signs. And that's what I want to look at in this part. I really want to just look at everything that the scriptures say about signs so that we can understand what's going on with signs because there's so much nuance in uh, the issue of signs. So signs, what a sign actually is, is it's, it's an indication of something. I was trying to think of another word that would explain exactly well, what is a sign. A sign's a pretty good thing if you've got already in your head what that is. But it's, it's an indication of something. In Matthew 26, we see Judas giving us a physical, real-world example of what it is to give a sign to somebody. He was delivering him up, gave them a sign. He said, whomever I kiss, it is he sees him. So now we've got a real world example. This is what giving a sign to somebody is. It's the same word, the same word that's used in the Septuagint for when he did his signs and wonders in Egypt. Acts 2.22 said, Men of Israel, hear these words, Yeshua of Nazareth, a man from Elohim, having been pointed out to you by mighty works and wonders and signs which Elohim did through him in your midst. He's been pointed out to you by these signs. 2 Kings 28 to 11 says, <laughs> And Chizkiyahu said to Yeshiyahu, What is the sign that Yehovah does heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of Yehovah the third day? And Yeshiyahu said, This is the sign for you from Yehovah, that Yehovah does the word that he's spoken. I, it's, just, it's funny to me how this is written, because it's not meant to mean this, as far as I can see. But this is kind of like an encapsulation of what signs are about. This is the sign for you from Yehovah 
that Yehovah does the word that he's spoken. That's the sign for you. But you'll see how that makes sense. I mean, it's funny to me that it's written like that. He says, this is the sign for you that Yehovah does the word that he's spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? So this is on a sundial. Okay, is it going to continue around the sundial? Is that going to be the sign? Or is it going to go backwards? And Chizkiyahu said it would be easy for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So we all know the sundial, the shadow's going around the sundial. If it went around the sundial as it's meant to, that would be easy, he says. If it went back, that would be hard. And this is an interesting attitude. If I have ever asked for a sign ever in my life, I will make sure that I ask Yehovah for something hard or hard. It's not hard for Yehovah to do, but something that is not down to the natural course of events. Okay, and I think that's particularly important, especially if it's something that you want to see, you want that answer, then you make it something hard. Okay, that's just what I do. Yeshiyahu the prophet cried out to Yehovah and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the, on the sundial of Achaz. Luke 2 verse 12 says, and this is the sign to you, this is when the angel comes to the shepherds, you shall find the baby wrapped up lying in the feeding trough. So this is how you're going to know, like Judas says, it's the one that I kiss, it's the baby that you find up, uh, you find wrapped up lying in a feeding trough. Now, as I'm going through this, I'm not going to reteach this teaching. If anyone's not seen it or if anyone can't remember the teaching in detail, I would say go back and watch this because the signs that I'm talking about are different from these sort of signs. These are signs that are kind of alternative spirituality signs, things that I, I've experienced in my life before, signs. It's when you interpret a sign according to the knowledge that's already in your mind rather than being told, this is going to be a sign or you ask Yehovah give me this particular sign it's seeing things happen in your life and then interpreting it and saying well this is what that means this is what Yehovah is trying to tell me that's very different okay a sign is an indication of something either something that you've asked for to be shown to you or something that Yehovah explains explicitly to you but as I say I recommend people go back and watch that Isaiah 44 24 to 25 says thus said Yehovah your redeemer and he who formed you from the womb I am Yehovah doing all stretching out the heavens all alone spreading out the earth with none beside me frustrating the signs of the babblers and driving diviners mad turning wise men backward and making their knowledge foolish I know exactly what he's talking about here these signs of the babblers and driving diviners mad I used to do divination I used to live life by these signs I used to feel like I had this really special relationship with God and that God walked me through my life giving me all of these signs and directing me here here there and everywhere and it's it's just nonsense it's just spiritual deception it's deceiving spirits doing things that seem impressive to you because you've got no kind of idea of spirituality or the spiritual realm but Yehovah says that he frustrates these things he drives the diviners mad so now that we understand what a sign is let's look at the idea of asking for a sign from Yehovah Judges 6, 16 to 23, it says, And Yehovah said to him, Because I am with you, you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Now, when countries are talked about, they're often talked about as something happening as one man, and we know that we are the one new man. Okay, we are Israel. Israel is often talked about as one man. Other nations as well are talked about as something happening to them as one man. They're seen as a man or a body. And he said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who are speaking with me. Don't be afraid of asking Yehovah for a sign. I've had uh, someone from America getting in touch saying that there was particular spiritual things that were happening to them and they wanted to know whether they were hearing from Yehovah or not. If you've ever wondered in anything, uh, we've talked about this before, Jilly, if you're hearing from Yehovah, don't be afraid to ask him for a sign. 
I think a lot of the time people are afraid to ask for a sign because they want to believe whatever it is they think that they're hearing from Yehovah. They want to believe it. So asking him for a sign, they think, oh no, that is hard. It's hard for Yehovah to do that. It's not hard. If he wants to speak to you and it is him speaking to you, he can certainly give you a sign that it's true. And if he doesn't give you a sign, then you know what, what does your imagination do with that? Well, perhaps he wasn't able to give me a sign or you know whatever else he's able to give you a sign please give me a sign that it's you who are speaking with me please do not move away from here until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you and he said I shall stay until you return and Gidon went in and prepared the young goat and unleavened bread from an aphor of flour the meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented it and the angel of Elohim said to him take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pull out the broth and he did so and the angel of Yehovah put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand touched the meat and the unleavened bread and the fire went up uh, went up out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread and the angel of Yehovah went from his sight and when Gidon saw that, uh, that he was an angel of Yehovah Gidon said O oh master Yehovah for I have seen an angel of Yehovah face to face and Yehovah said to him peace be with you do not fear and do not die I think people have got an idea in their head that it's bad to ask for a sign yeah, because Yeshua said, didn't he? A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. And we're going to look at that. Genesis 24, 12 to 14. Okay, this is Eletzar, um, Avram's servant. And he said, Yehovah Elohim of my master Avraham, please cause her to meet before me this day and show kindness to my master Avraham. So he calls on his name, whether or not he knows that he is, he is. See, I'm standing here by the fountain of water and the daughters of men of the city are coming out uh, to draw water, the men of the city. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar to let me drink. And she says, drink and let me water your camels too. Let her be the one whom you have appointed. So he asked for a very specific sign. He's not afraid. He's not thinking, oh, maybe, maybe yeah, I can't do it. Maybe it's hard. No, he says, let, let this be. In Isaiah 7, 7 to 17, it says, Thus said the Master Yehovah, It is not going to stand, nor shall it take place. This is Yehovah speaking. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Retzin. And within 65 years, Ephraim is to be broken as a people. And he's speaking to the king here, the king of the northern kingdom. And the head of Ephraim is Shomeron, and the head of Shomeron is Remel Yahu. If you do not believe, you are not steadfast. And Yehovah spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from Yehovah your Elohim. Make deep the request, or make it high. Make it difficult for me to do, in, in your own estimation. But what's the thing that he's asking for a sign for? That his kingdom's going to be destroyed? So what does Ahaz say? He doesn't want to believe this. He says, I do not ask nor try, Yehovah. Oh, of course. Of course, you don't, you don't want a sign that that's going to happen. And he said, Here now, O house of David, is it not enough that you weary men, that you weary my Elohim also? Therefore, Yehovah himself gives you a sign. Look, a virgin conceives and gives birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He eats curds and honey when he knows uh, how to re refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child knows to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that you dread uh, is to be forsaken by both her kings. And we'll look at this later. Before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Yehovah brings on you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim turned away from Yehudah, the king of Assyria. That's what he's going to bring upon you. And look, I'll give you a sign. Oh no, no, I don't, I don't want to ask for a sign. No, I will give you a sign. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So one can see things that should make you believe and yet not. And this is really important because when we're dealing with 
how to witness to people or whatever else. A lot of the time what we do is we try to prove that God exists. I've had numerous requests recently, maybe two, three requests, um, about how do we prove that the scriptures are true? What can we show to people that they need to have faith in the scriptures? And there's nothing that you can show to people. You can show them a million proofs that God exists and they'll just twist it and make it something else in their head. If they don't want to see it, like a chaz didn't want to see it, they won't see it. So you can spend all your time showing people videos and this is definitely true and this is what's going to happen and this is, you know, look at creation and all of the creation science and everything. You can try to convince somebody intellectually that God exists, but even if they can see it, they still will not believe in him and it's that belief which is necessary. Deuteronomy 3, 21 to 22 says, this is Moshe speaking, he says, I commanded Yehoshua at that time saying, your eyes have seen all that Yehovah your Elohim has done to these two kings. This is um, Og and Sihon. Yehovah does the same to all the kings which you are passing over. Do not fear them for Yehovah your Elohim himself fights for you. Now Yehoshua we know had faith. But the people of Israel had seen all of these things too. They'd seen all of the signs and wonders before they were um, about to cross over the land, and yet they still would not cross over the land. I use this piece of scripture because it, it illustrates it quite succinctly. Exodus 7 verse 3 says, But I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh, and shall increase my signs and my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. So Pharaoh saw all of these things. He knew that Yehovah was Elohim. He knew that he was more powerful than all of the gods in Egypt. And yet he still did not come to a belief in Yehovah. And you see that throughout all the kings in the Bible. King Nebuchadnezzar, he saw the power of Yehovah. He saw that it was him who put him in place. We never came to believe in him, never came to trust in him. So belief in signs is not a belief founded on anything stable. So even if you can get somebody to believe that Yah exists through showing, showing them something, that's not going to cause them to get where you want them to go. The only thing that can cause somebody to believe in Yah is you showing them his character, his name. John 6, 12 to 15 says, And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather the broken pieces that are left over so that none gets wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with broken pieces of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then men, having seen the sign that Yeshua did, said, Truly this is the prophet who is coming to the world. Then Yeshua, knowing that they were about to come and seize him, that they might make him king, withdrew again to the mountain alone by himself. So they saw, and Yeshua knew that their belief that he was the Messiah was real enough for them to come and to make him king. But we know that these people fell away. And we'll look at what happens at the end of John 6 to even his disciples who had been following him. They were following him. They believed in him because of the signs and wonders that they'd seen him doing. But ultimately, they did not believe in his name. And it's, it's that thing. And we'll look at that. We'll look at how scripture teaches that. Acts 8, 5 to 23 gives us an interesting situation. This is um, Simon the Magician. The story of Simon the Magician. And going down to the city of Shomeron, Philip proclaimed Messiah to them. And the crowds with one mind heeded what Philip said. Okay, so they've all heeded what he said. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That's why they heeded what he said. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So they saw these things and they heeded what he said. There came to be great joy in the city. So hold on to that. They've received the word with great joy. Now there was a certain man called Shimon, Simon, who 
formerly was practicing magic in the city, and he was astonishing the people of Shomeron with his signs and wonders, with his magic and his garbage, claiming to be someone great, to whom they were all giving heed. Oh, what do you know? These people in Shomeron, they like their signs and wonders. When someone comes along and does something that amazes them, they give heed to what they're saying. From the least to the greatest, saying, this one is the power of Elohim, which is great. And they were giving heed to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. And when they believed Philip as he brought the good news about the kingdom of Elohim in the name of Yeshua Messiah, both men and women were immersed. Shimon himself also believed. And when he was immersed, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the science which took place. So this is why he was immersed and this is why he continues with him and he's amazed by these continuing signs and wonders. And when the apostles who were at Yerushalayim heard that Shomeron had received the word of Elohim, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come, prayed for them to receive the set-apart spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been immersed in the name of the Master Yeshua. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the set-apart spirit. And Shimon, seeing that through the laying on of hands of the apostles the set-apart spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this authority too, so that anyone I lay hands on shall receive the set-apart spirit. But Peter said to him, let your silver perish with you because you thought to buy the gift of Elohim through money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right through Elohim. But Simon believed when he saw the signs and wonders, but his heart was not right before Elohim. He hadn't actually believed in who Elohim was. He believed in the signs and the wonders. Repent therefore of this evil of yours and plead with Elohim to forgive you the intention of your heart. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by unrighteousness. So again, his belief is just in what he sees. Mark 4 says, the sower sows the word. These then are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word that was sown in their hearts. Okay, so they hear the word, you know, need to repent of these things. Immediately though, Satan comes. What's Satan? He's the tempter. He comes with the temptation. And immediately he takes away the word. You don't want to be following that. You want this instead. And the person immediately strays from what they've heard. Likewise, these are the ones on rocky places who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it in joy. What was there in the city? There was great joy. They have no root in themselves, but are short-lived. Then when pressure or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they stumble. So you might be able to get somebody to believe in a sign or a wonder. Look, this amazing thing happened in my life. This was Elohim. And they might think, well, maybe it was. Most people, I think, pervert it and make it something else in their head, but maybe they believe. But the goal that we have, or the goal that Yah has, it's not our goal, we just show the light to people. The goal that Yah has is to get people to bear fruit. If once people have believed, they will immediately go astray, or when persecution arises, immediately they stumble. Those among the thorns hear the word. The worries of this age, the seat of riches and desires for other matters entering in, choke the word and it becomes fruitless because what's going on in someone's heart is where, where Yah needs to reach them. Because if it hasn't changed what's going on in their heart, they might believe it at first, but then when something that makes it difficult for them to do comes up, immediately they're going to fall away. So signs and wonders have a purpose which we'll look at but belief solely on signs and wonders is not a belief in something stable those sown on good soil are those who hear the word and accept it that's what you need you need somebody to hear the word or to see who Yahuwah is and to believe in his name and accept the word might be something that they're going to get persecuted for it might be something against something else that they want but they hear the word and they accept it and they do it and bear fruit some 30-fold and some 60 and some 100-fold. 
Exodus 14, 30 to 31 says thus, Yehovah saved Yisrael that day out of the hand of the Mitrites, and Yisrael saw the Mitrites dead on the seashore. And Yisrael saw the great work which Yehovah had done in Mitraim, and the people feared Yehovah and believed Yehovah and his servant Moshe. Well, okay, great. They believed in the servant Moshe. How, do, how long did that last? Okay, a couple of days, maybe? Their belief is not founded in anything solid. They saw something and they believed in it. So when we're trying to reach people, if we're trying to show them something so that they believe in it, that's garbage. It's not going to be enduring. What we need to show them, again, is the name of Yehovah. We need to show them who it is because no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws them. Well, how is the Father going to draw that person if you don't show them who he is, show them who Yehovah is? John 20, 26 to 31 says, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Tomah with them. Yeshua came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Bring your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My master and my Elohim. Yeshua said to him, Tomah, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. There were indeed many other signs, so this is a sign that Yeshua did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you believe that Yeshua is Messiah, the son of Elohim, and the believing you might possess life in his name. So what's the difference with Thomas? He wasn't believing, and then he saw a sign, and he believed. So why is Thomas okay? Why is Thomas an apostle? It's the same issue. Okay, he believed in the name of Yehovah long before this. In this event, he needed proof that Yeshua was there before him. He needed to put his finger in his side, and then he believed that it was Yeshua. But his belief in the word was what all of that was founded on. So all the way through this, what we're going to see is that it's belief in the word which has to undergird these signs in order for them to mean anything. So if you try to show signs and wonders, or you try to show Yehovah's signs and wonders to somebody without that underlying belief in the word, it's not going to be founded on anything. John 4:46 4, to 53 said, Then Yeshua came again to Cana of Galileo, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Kephanachum. When he heard that Yeshua had come from Yehuda into Galileo, he went to him and was asking him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. Yeshua then said to him, If you do not see signs and wonders, you do not believe at all. I think what he's kind of alluding to here is the idea that signs and wonders can give you a certain amount of belief. But if you don't see them, you're not going to believe even to that degree. <laughs> Perhaps not. The nobleman said to him, Master, come down before my child dies. Yeshua said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Yeshua spoke to him and went. And while he was going down, his servants met him and reported, saying, Your son lives. He then asked them, from, uh, he asked them the hour from which he became better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the information left. Then the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Yeshua said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed in all his household. So you've got him believing the word, and then him believing the sign. So it's more about believing the message that the signs accompany. That's what belief is, okay? Matthew 12, 38 to 42 says, Then some of, the, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now that's not a statement that exists in, in isolation. He's not saying, If you seek a sign, you're wicked and adulterous. Okay, not what he's saying. He's saying that they are wicked and adulterous, and he's not going to give them a sign. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it. This generation, this wicked and adulterous generation, which is seeking a sign. You want a sign, you're wicked and adulterous, I'm not going to give you one. He's not saying any asking for signs is wicked and adulterous. Except the sign of the prophet Yonah. And we'll see that more clearly when we look at other um, accounts of this same event. 
Whereas Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Men of Nineveh shall stand up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So they had a sign and they repented at his preaching, at the message that accompanied the sign. And look, a greater than Jonah is here. So to have the message and then to have signs, that's great. Like us in our lives, we have things where we can see Yehovah at work in our lives. But we believe the word, and that came first, and that undergirded the whole thing. And then we have signs in our lives, and that's great. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Shlomo. She didn't have any signs. She just came for the wisdom. John 2, 13 to 22 says, And the Passover of the Jews was near, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem, And he found in the set-apart place those selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers sitting. So what they were doing here is they were making money off the fact that the people would have to come and give an offering. Okay, so they were actually selling the offerings, obviously at a profit, to make money from the fact that the people were required from, to do this. The money changes, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the shekel hakodesh, the, the holy shekel. Everything had to be done according to this shekel because it was an unaltered shekel. The shekels that were going about in society, the silver shekels, maybe people had shaved some silver off them. So the just weight and measure was the holy shekel and that's what it had to be paid in. What these people were doing is they were saying, okay, you need a holy shekel. Well, it's going to cost you five shekels for this. They weren't saying, we'll use the holy shekel as a weight and we'll see whether your shekel matches up with it. They were saying, buy a holy shekel from us for an overinflated rate. Let's say five shekels for a holy shekel. So Yeshua sees these things. He sees them making money off people needing to follow the word. And having made a whip of cords, he drove them all out the set-apart place with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. And he said to those selling doves, take these away. Do not make the house of my father a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house has eaten me up, as we saw before in Psalm 69. And the Yehudim answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you are doing these? He sure answered and said to them, Destroy this dwelling place, and in three days I shall raise it. Then the Yehudim said, It took 46 years to build this dwelling place, and you're going to raise it in three days? But well, he spoke about the dwelling place of his body. So what he says to them is exactly the same thing that he said to the others. He said, You're not going to get a sign apart from the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's exactly what he's saying here. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Yeshua had said. So they saw the sign. They believed the word. Luke 11, 29 to 32 says, And when the, while the crowds were thronging, he began to say, This generation is wicked. It seeks a sign. So there you go. That's what he was talking about. That generation is wicked. It seeks a sign. No sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Not a bad thing to ask for signs though. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the son of Adam shall be to this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of the gen this generation, condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Shlomo. And look, a greater than Shlomo is here. What he's saying to these people all the way through, and we're going to look at a lot of these encounters with Yeshua and people. We're going to see how he dealt with those people who just didn't get it. What he's basically getting across to them is, forget about everything else. Concentrate on the light. Concentrate on the fact that I've come here to show you the Father's name. And if you can get that, you'll get all of the rest of it. The men of Nineveh shall stand up in judgment of this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So again, somebody who just gets the wisdom and somebody who sees a sign and believes the message. 
Mark 8, 11 to 12 says, And the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, trying him, and sighing deeply in his spirit. And I love that it says this, because it makes me feel better about how uh, I feel about people sometimes. He said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. They, there's a real sadness to how Yeshua deals with people. And like I say, you know, if you've ever just been face to face with somebody who just doesn't get it and you've just been like, <sighs> it's like this. I'll explain it again for you. Yeshua felt the same. I presume that he did. That's how it reads to me. But maybe that's me reading it through the lens of me. Matthew 16, 1 to 4 says, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came and trying him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answering said to them, When it's evening, you say, Fair weather, for heaven is red. And in the morning, stormy weather today, for the heaven is red and overcast. You know how to discern the face of the heaven, but you're unable to discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and went away. Again, what he's saying to them is, you just don't get, I've come in my father's name. I'm doing all of these works of my father. But you, you focus in on the minutiae of the situation. You're trying to work out how this can be and how that can be. And they were asking him all kinds of questions. Like, you know, um, it's said that we will not know from where the Messiah comes. So how can you be the Messiah? Because we know where you come from. And just all the way through it, what you see and what we'll see as we go through is Yeshua is just he doesn't spend time with them trying to explain all of the ins and outs of it he doesn't sit down and go well actually this is how it works and you know this that and the other and this is what's going to happen he just doesn't he just says basically believe in me when I'm here see the things that I do and believe in it and then he just kind of gets up and he just <laughs> leaves them to it so understanding the underlying message is something that has to be revealed to you, okay? It has to be something that accords with something inside of you. John 12, 34 to 48 says, the crowd answering, uh, answered him, we have heard out of the Torah that me, the Messiah remains forever. And how do you say that the son of Adam has to be lifted up? Who is this son of Adam? You know, we found something in the word and we're going to say that you're not the Messiah because of it. Yeshua therefore said to them, yeah, a little while the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. And he who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. So he doesn't say, well, actually, what's going to happen is I'm going to be crucified, and then I'm going to raise from the dead, and then I'm going to go up to heaven. So I am actually going to remain forever. But it's not just quite the way that you're thinking about it. He just says, listen, this is how it is. I am going to die, and I'm only going to be with you for a little time to be a light to you. While I am with you, walk in the light, believe in the light. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you become sons of, sons of light. These words Yeshua spoke and went off and was hidden from them. Didn't spend all that time trying to explain everything to them. If they got it, they got it. If they didn't get it, they didn't get it. I'm here. You're either going to know that I've come from Elohim or you're not going to know that I've come from Elohim. I'm not going to sit down with you and explain the ins and outs of this over and over again. But though he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, even on that level. That the word of Yeshiahu, the prophet, might be filled, which he spoke, Yahuvah, who has believed our report, to whom has the arm of Yahuvah, Yeshua, been revealed? Because of this, they were unable to believe. Because again, Yeshayahu said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. And we know that the one that does that is actually Hasatan. He's the tool of Yahuwah to achieve this. So that they should not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I should heal them. Yeshayahu said when he saw his esteem and spoke of him, Still, even among the rulers, many did believe in him. 
But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the congregation. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of Elohim. And we're going to see this about the, the fact that the rulers did actually believe in them. They believed in his signs, but there was something which we'll look at which stopped them from accepting him and from believing on the name. They didn't believe in the name. Then Yeshua cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I'm going to know that I'm from Elohim. I have come as a light into the world so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And if anyone hears my words but does not watch over them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So when we're speaking to people, you know, try and convince them and try to explain all of the problems that they've got. I mean, give an answer for the faith that's in you, for sure. But don't fixate on it and be like if only I could explain this thing better to this person they get it like us when we went and spoke um, with the people at the old church you know, like if only we could, we could show them this maybe they get it but they just didn't believe in his name so when you come speaking truth to them they're not going to accept it they can't accept it literally it, it just doesn't make sense to them and we'll look at that then come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one who judges him. And that's going to be the word that I've spoken, and that's going to judge him in the last day, because he's not going to have believed in it when he heard it. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31 says, For the word of the cross is indeed foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of Elohim. The two things just cannot mix together. You try to explain something to somebody. You have the Messiah died, then he rose from the dead, having freed us from the power of death and ransomed us from under the hand of Hasatan. They're just going to be like, what are you talking about? That's craziness. But to us who believe it is the power of Elohim, it's such a precious thing. For it has been written, I shall destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the learning of the learned ones. Where is the wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not Elohim made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of Elohim, the world through wisdom did not know Elohim. They did not know his name to trust in it. It pleased Elohim through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe, to save those who hear it, and they go, that's right. I believe in that. I don't have to understand all of the periphery things in order to finally come to a belief in this. I know that that's right. Since Yahudim ask a sign and Greeks seek wisdom, Okay, and if you provide either of them with those things, it's still not going to cause belief. Yet we proclaim Messiah crucified to the Yehudim a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. It just doesn't make sense. The, the things are antithetical to each other. They just don't, don't work together. You cannot explain to somebody belief in the name of Yehovah. They're just not going to understand it. It's not something you can convey to somebody in words. And to those who are called both Yehudim and Greeks, Messiah, the power of Elohim, and the wisdom of Elohim. Okay, to those who are called, those who understand his name, both Yehudim and Greeks among them, you know, come from a people who are seeking science, come from people who need everything explained. Messiah is the power of Elohim. For the foolishness of Elohim is wiser than men, and the weakness of Elohim is stronger than men. For look at your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many no mighty, not many noble. But Elohim has chosen the foolish matters of the world to put to shame the wise, because he's chosen the ones that will hear of him and understand him and believe in him. And that will never make any sense to the wise of the world. And Elohim has chosen the lowborn of the world and the despised and the ones that are not, that he might bring to naught the ones that are. Not that everybody that he's chosen has to be lowborn or without the wisdom of the world or whatever else, but he's chosen the people who believe in him, which is always going to be foolishness to the world. 
so that no flesh should boast in his presence. And of him, you're in Messiah Yeshua, who became for us wisdom from Elohim, righteousness also, and set apartness and redemption. And those things are all the things that you could never explain to anybody. How Messiah is wisdom from Elohim. He's righteousness to us. Holiness, redemption, all of those things, you either get them or you don't. They're either going to accord with you or they're not. You're either going to know his voice or you're not. But as it has been written, let him who boasts, let him boast in Yehovah. Jeremiah 9 says, Thus said Yehovah, let not the wise boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty boast in his might, nor let the rich boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. Okay, you understand and you know his name, you understand and you know him. That I am Yehovah doing kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. That's his name. They understand and they know his name. Let you boast in this if you're going to boast in anything. For in these I delight, declares Yehovah. And these are the things that you can never explain to someone in a million years. You can show them to somebody and then that can accord with them. And they can be drawn to the Father through that. But you're never going to be able to show them a video. You're never going to be able to show them a sign or a wonder that's going to make them believe in this, believe in the word. John 6, 25 to 46 says, Therefore, when the crowd saw that Yeshua was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves also entered into the boats and came to Kfar Nachum seeking Yeshua. So this is John 6. This is after he's just done the miracle for them with the bread and the loaves. And having found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Yeshua answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, even, but because you ate of the loaves and were satisfied. You've come here because I gave you food. Do not labor for the food that's perishing, but for the food that is remaining to everlasting life, which the son of Adam shall give to you, for the father Elohim has set his seal on him. So they said to him, What should we do to work the works of Elohim? Yeshua answered and said to them, This is the work of Elohim, that you believe in him whom he sent. So they said to him, What sign then would you do so that we see and believe in you? What would you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it had been written. He gave them bread out of the heaven to eat. And therefore Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moshe did not give you the bread out of heaven, but my father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of Elohim is he who comes down out of the heaven and gives life to the world. So he already knows at this point they don't believe in him. They say, how do we do the works of Elohim? And he says, this is the work of Elohim, that you believe in him who, whom he'd sent. And they're like, okay, give us a sign then so that we can believe in you. <laughs> you already don't believe. So they said to him, Master, give us this bread always. That sounds brilliant. Give us the true bread out of heaven. We want this. Give us it always. Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not get hungry at all. He who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all. It's like, I want to give you this bread always. You ask me to give you this bread always, but it's really not that, that simple. Could be, but you just don't get me. You don't believe in me. I come and I do the works of the Father. I show you and I'm a light to you and you, you don't believe in me. But I said to you that you've seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I shall by no means cast out. I will give them the bread of life always. But they've got to see me and believe in me. You've seen me and have not believed in me. Because I have come down out of heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should not lose of it, but should raise it in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should possess everlasting life. Remember, these people have seen him and not believed in him. And I shall raise him up in the last day. Therefore, the Yahudim were grumbling against him because he said, I am the bread which came down out of the heaven. They, they don't get it. They're engaging with it on another level. They're trying to understand these things. And they said, is not this Yeshua, the son of Yosef, whose father and mother we know? 
How is it then that he says, I have come down out of the heaven? Then Yeshua answered and said to them, Do not grumble with one another. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I shall raise him up in the last day. There's a sadness to it. There is when I read that anyway. He's just like, listen, don't, don't argue among one another. None of you can come to me unless the Father draws him. And I've come and I've shown you the Father and you've not been drawn to the Father. You've seen me and you've not believed. It has been written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by Yehovah. Everyone then who has heard from the Father and learned comes to me. Again, through what he's shown them. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from Elohim. He has seen the Father, and I believe this is talking about understood the Father, but it's not overly relevant to this. So then later in John 6, we see this happening. Therefore, many of his disciples, having heard, said, This word is hard. Who is able to hear it? But Yeshua, knowing within himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Does this make you stumble? This is after he said they've got to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. What if you see the son of Adam going up where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh does not profit at all. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For you sure knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would deliver him up. And it's funny, isn't it? You can know almost straight off the bat those who believe in his name and those who just don't get it. I'm afraid they don't get it. And he said, because of this, I have said to you that no one is able to come to me unless it has been given to him by my Father. And we saw that it's been given to people to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. From then on, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Yeshua therefore said to the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Uh, then Shimon Kepha answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You possess the words of everlasting life. They got it. It didn't matter that he'd come and he'd said something difficult to them. They didn't say, Oh, no, 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 we totally get that we're to eat your flesh and drink your blood. That's, that's obvious. They said, Where else would we go? You've spoken something hard, but we understand your name. And if you understand his name, then when you come to things in the word that are difficult for you, that are hard for you, that might cause you persecution or might cause you to lose something that you want, you can accept them because you trust in his name and that underlies all of it. And this is the problem with people who end up rejecting Yeshua. They come to the New Testament and Charlie will know what I mean if I said, I found my first fail. <laughs> Because they don't believe in the name of Yehovah. That underlies it. So when they find something in the scriptures that they see to be a problem, like, well, the Messiah, it says that we won't know where he came from and we know where Yeshua came from. It causes them to stumble and it causes them to fall away. But it's because they do not understand the name of Yehovah. Because if you know the name of Yehovah, then you read the words of Yeshua and you say, this man is from Yehovah. And if I find something that he says that I don't understand, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to se seek it out and find out what it is. And it's the same with Paul. When you read Paul's words, if you don't know the name of Yehovah, you'll read them. And you might find something within them. Peter says he's hard to understand. And you might think he's hard to understand. And you might not bear with him because you don't recognize his name in the things that he's saying. If I read Paul, I can see Yehovah all over Paul's writings. I can see that his words were inspired by Yehovah. It's obvious to me. And it's the same with Yeshua. But people come to a point where they stumble with Paul and they stumble with Yehovah. And it's because they do not believe in the name of Yehovah. So if anybody is watching, and we've had comments recently about the false apostle Paul, I would say to you, if you think that that's not true, go and read Paul's words again. Maybe it's been a while since you've watched, since you've read the words of Paul from beginning to end, his actual letters. Read them and see if you see Yehovah in those things. 
So believing in his name, this is key to the signs. John 12, 44 to 46 says, Then Yeshua cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So when you see me, you see me doing these actions and you believe in me, it's not you believing in me because I'm not doing my own actions. I'll explain this by way of an example. Here's my wallet. If I went round to Charlie's house, I dropped my wallet on the floor, I went home, I think I've got 20 pound in my wallet. Is Charlie gonna steal the 20 pound and pretend he couldn't find the wallet? I think that. I would think, there is no way that Charlie's going to do that. And how would I know that he wasn't going to do that? Because I know that he follows Yehovah. I don't think Charlie would have done it anyway. But I know for a fact that he wouldn't do it because he follows Yehovah. So it's not me believing in Charlie. It's me believing in Yehovah. Okay? Makes sense. Much more likely to find Charlie doing this. (laughs) for the same reason. John 11, 37 to 42. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. But if I do, though you do not believe in me, believe the works, so that you know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, but he went forth out of their hand. Just don't get it. I'm coming. I'm doing all these works of the Father. This is all great. And what did they do? Let's get him. And went once more to the other side of the Ardain, to the place where Yochanan was immersing at first, and there he stayed. And many came to him and said, Yochanan indeed did no sign. Yet all that Yochanan said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. John 5:24 Truly truly I say to you he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me possesses everlasting life and does not come into judgment but has passed from life, from death into life about hearing the word believing in the name So wickedness can cause one to disregard signs Okay, and this is another reason why showing to people who have not turned their hearts to the Lord is is not an effective way of reaching them. John nine thirteen to sixteen says they brought to the Pharisees the one who was once blind. Now it was the Sabbath when Yeshua made the clay and opened his eyes. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him again how he'd received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from Elohim because he does not guard the Sabbath. Now they didn't understand his name, obviously. If they understood his name, they'd understand what the Sabbath is about. Okay, they'd understand that it's not about, you know, like the Jews do, going along and marking out, like, I can't even remember what they do. They, they put things at certain distances and that kind of marks out a boundary in which they're able to go. You know, these people, he's healed somebody on the Sabbath. That's working. You know, they just they don't understand the Sabbath because they don't understand his name. Others said, how is a man who is a sinner able to do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And I include this just to show you that there, there was belief of him among the Pharisees, as we'll see as we go on. The word of Elohim spread and the number of the disciples increased greatly in Yerushalayim and a great many of the priests were obedient to the belief. A great many of the priests. Stephanus, filled with belief and power, this is Stephen, did great wonders and signs among the people. And some of those of the so-called congregation of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Kilikia in Asia, rose up disputing with Stephanus. But they were unable to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, it still isn't going to cause them to believe in it. But I've had this so many times. And someone comes with like a, oh, well, what about this? You speak the truth to them. And when you speak the truth to people, they cannot resist 
the wisdom of Elohim because you've spoken the truth to them. But it's still not going to make them believe. You come doing signs and wonders too. Then they instigated men to say, we have heard them speak blasphemous words against Moshe and Elohim. They couldn't resist what he was saying. They had nothing to argue with him about. He came doing signs and wonders, but then what's the, the next thing they do? They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, so they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this set-apart place and against the Torah. Just like with Paul, it's the exact same thing that Paul is accused of. Okay, he was accused of it back then, and he's accused of it now. John 11, 43 to 50 says, And when he, had, when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Eletzar, come out, this is Lazarus. And he who died came out bound feet and hands with wrappings, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. Yeshua said to them, Loosen him and let him go. Therefore many of the Yahudim who had come to Miriam and had seen what Yeshua did, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them what Yeshua did. Of course they did. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do because this man does many signs? They're not saying, This man is doing loads of signs. This is brilliant. We will go and follow this man. What are we going to do? He's doing many signs. If we let him alone like this, they are all going to believe in him and the Romans shall come and take away from us both our place a nation. So they had forecast into the future these events that were going to happen. They had no trust in Elohim. They just said, what are we going to do? They believe in him. This terrible thing that we've pre pre-decided in our minds is the actual eventuality which is going to take place. That's what's going to take place. So we'll disregard this science. And one of them, Caiaphas, being a high priest that year, said to them, you know not, neither do you consider that it is better for us that one man die for the people than that the entire nation should perish. So even the high priest, he sees his signs and he says, you know what, it's going to be better for us if we get rid of him. In Acts 4, 13 to 17, it says, And seeing the boldness of Peter and John, they, and perceiving that they were unlearned and ordinary men, they marveled. And they recognized that they had been with the Yeshua. And seeing the, ma uh, seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not contradict it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they consulted with one another, saying, What should we do to these men? For indeed, uh, an outstanding miracle has been done through them. It's apparent to all those dwelling in Yerushalayim. And we're unable to deny it. We can't contradict it. We can't say anything against this. This sign has been done. But in order that it spreads no further among the people, let us strongly threaten them to speak no more to anyone in this name. You see why you cannot reach people by showing them things about Elohim. Okay, you could show them the very works of the apostles. And if it's not in their mind to believe in the name, if they don't know Elohim and you've not shown them Elohim, it's, it's going to be worthless and they'll fall away. Acts 5, 12 to 33 says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one mind in Solomon's porch. But of the rest, no one had the courage to join them. However, the people made much of them. And more believers were added to the master, large numbers of both men and women, so that they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that the, at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. A large number also also gathered from the surrounding cities to Yerushalayim, bringing sick ones and those who were troubled by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Can you imagine this scene in the city? Them bringing out people in their beds, and the streets being full of beds of sick people, and people who are tormented by demons, and people coming from other cities to be healed by these people because word had spread. The high priest rose up, and all those with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. And they seized the apostles, and they put them in the public jail. But an angel of Yehovah opened the prison doors at night and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the set-apart place and speak to all the people all the words of life, of this life. 
Now when they heard, they went to the set apart place early in the morning and were teaching. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison for them to be brought. But having come, the officers did not find them in the prison and they went back and reported it, saying, we found the prison shut in all safety and the watchers standing outside before the doors. But having opened them, we found no one inside. And as the high priest and captain of the set-apart place and the chief priest heard these words, they were puzzled and wondered what this might be. But one came and reported to them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the set-apart place, teaching the people. And the captain went with the officers and brought them, not with force, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Just like with John, when you sure asked them the question, he said, well, what about with John? And they were afraid to give an answer because the people knew that John was a prophet. Having brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Name that they didn't recognize. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring blood, uh, the blood of this man upon us. And Kepha and the other apostles answering said, we have to obey Elohim rather than men. Okay, so obviously this is important because we've talked a lot recently about obeying authority. And you are to obey the human authorities apart from when they're trying to get you to break the word of Elohim. And it's pretty good. We're all pretty blessed in that we have no authorities trying to get us to break the word. The Elohim of our fathers raised up Yeshua, whom you laid hands on, hanging him on a tree. Him a prince and a savior, Elohim is exalted to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That's what's going on here. It's why we're freed from the prison. It's why the, the streets are fill, filled with the sick who have been healed. And we are as witnesses to these matters. And so also is the set-apart spirit whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. Who obey him. And those hearing were cut. Yeshua, who you killed, he came to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That's the name that we're proclaiming. And we're witnesses to these matters. And they were cut. Okay, they were convicted and took counsel to kill him. It doesn't really matter. You'll speak the word of Elohim to some people and they're going to know that they're wrong. They're going to know that they're in the wrong. But because they prefer the darkness, they're going to choose the darkness over the light because their deeds were evil. Really, when we're trying to reach people, all we can do is walk like Yeshua did and show them the light. And if they don't get it, they don't get it. Yeshua didn't spend all of his time trying to convince all of these people, no, you must see it. He just said, look, I've come and shown you the Father. Believe in the light while it's with you, because it's not going to be with you. And then he left. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. And I think this is why people, um, why people don't want to accept things. Search me, O Eil, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if an idolatrous way is in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, that is a scary prayer to many people. Okay, if you know his name, it's not a scary prayer. Okay, but it is to many people who don't want to hear the word. The idea that Elohim would search them and know what is inside them. We want him to do this. Lead me in the way everlasting. If there's any iniquity within us, lead us in the way. And I include this verse because I've had a conversation recently with somebody who's terrified that they're ever going to do something wrong before Elohim. And I, I just had to be like, well, the thing that you're talking about, did you think that it was wrong? The thing that you were doing, was it you, you thought that you were doing something wrong about, against him? And this person was like, well, no, but maybe something that I'm doing is wrong. And, it, you know, if you've read the things in the Word about what happens if you do things that are wrong against him. But again, that comes from not understanding his name. Okay. He says, if you say, see, we did not know this, would not he who weighs the hearts discern it? He watches over your life. Would he not know it? And shall he not repay man according to his work? Okay, he's not out to just smite people. He's not like, there's got to be something that they're doing that's not quite right. I'll be able to get them on that thing. 
He weighs our hearts. Okay, this is a concept in British law. It's called a strict liability offence. In British law, in order to be found guilty of most crimes, you have to be doing something wrong and you have to be thinking something wrong. It's called the actus reus and the mens rea. The guilty act and the guilty mind. Okay, a strict liability offence in British law is when mens rea, guilty mind, is not required. So just the fact that you're doing something makes you guilty of it. Now with Yehovah, sin is sin, and if you're doing something that's sin, it doesn't matter if you're ignorant of it or not, but you will be forgiven of that. In order to be condemned for it, you have to have the guilty mind, or in biblical speak, a guilty heart before Yehovah. He's not like this. These things exist because a court cannot possibly know your mind. So if you are speeding, that's a strict liability offense. You don't have to prove that the person was intending to speed, that they were reckless to speed, or that they were negligent as to whether they were speeding or not. It doesn't matter. It's just, you speed and you're guilty. That's because the court can't weigh your heart. In Yehovah's court, he can weigh your heart. And he can know, and he will find you not guilty if you don't have the requisite guilty mind. John 7, 24 to 36 says, Therefore, some of them from Yerushalayim said, Is this not he whom they are seeking to kill? And see, he speaks boldly, and they say none to him at all. Could it be that the rulers truly know that this is truly the Messiah? And we know that this was true for some of them. And we know where this one is from, and when Messiah comes, no one knows where he's from. Thank God I'm on this, he's not the Messiah. We know where you're from, and no one knows where the Messiah is from. When, when he comes, we will not know. Yeshua therefore cried out in the set apart place, teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I'm from. I'm not coming myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. You, don't kn you do not know him who, who sent me. That's what it means when it says, you're not going to know from where the Messiah comes. But I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Again, he just illustrates this to them. He just basically says, you don't know Elohim. This is the problem here. So they were seeking to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the crowd believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, shall he do more signs than these which this one did? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these matters concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to seize him. Therefore Yeshua said to them, yet a little while I am with you, then I go to him who sent me. You shall seek me, and you shall not find me, and where I am, you are unable to come. The Jews therefore said to themselves, Where is he about to go that we shall not find him? Is he about to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and to teach the Greeks? He's just laid it out for them. I'm from the Father, you don't know him. You're not going to be able to go there. You're going to seek me and will not be able to find me because I'm going to the Father and you cannot find him because you don't seek him. What is this word which he said? You shall seek me and you shall not find me. And where I am, you're unable to come. People get so caught up in all of this that they just miss the bigger picture. And that's why they get caught up in all of this because they just can't figure it out. And what you're trying to tell them is so different from where they're coming from. So in all of this, and we're drawing to a close now, small amount left, we need to remember that Yehovah does show his approval through science. Okay. Mark 18, 19 to 20 says, Then indeed, after the Master had spoken to them, he was raised up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of Elohim. And they went out and proclaimed it everywhere while the Master worked with them. And he confirmed the word through the accompanying signs. So like I said, believe in the word and then having signs happen, that's great. And that's what we experience in our lives. But you can't then tell to somebody all of the signs and all the things Yehovah has done in your life and then them just get it and be like, okay, I get it now and I get the word. It's not going to reach them. Okay, they need to have that underlying belief in the word in the first place. 
Acts 2, 41 to 43 says, Then those indeed who gladly received his word were immersed. And on that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they were continuing steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles. Received the word, continuing in the teaching. And in the fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So this is the correct way. This is how it works. This is... Um, this is cementing what they're doing basically they believed the word and then they saw the signs and wonders and it came to be in Iconian that they went together into the congregation of the Yehudim and spoke in such a way that great, a great number of both Yehudim and Greeks believed. They spoke in such a way that a great number of them believed. They believed the word when they heard it. But the Yehudim who would not obey so again, we've got the ones who believed being contrasted with those who wouldn't obey, stirred up the Gentiles and evilly influenced their souls against the brothers. So they remained a long time speaking boldly in the master who was bearing witness to the word of his favor, giving signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And we've seen this a number of times throughout this. Okay, they came, a load of people believed, and then the ones who didn't, didn't understand his name, didn't understand any of it, they evilly influenced people against them. Okay, they told lies about them. But it's because they didn't understand these things. Or, more sinister, they were caught by those things. They were convicted by the things that they heard. And in their minds, they didn't want to admit that it was true or whatever that looks like. And so they did evil towards people. So this is something we should expect too. And the crowd of the city was divided, and some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. So Yehovah also allows people to be deceived by signs. It's all about the message that they cause one to believe. That's the entire thing. Okay, signs and wonders can cause you to believe the word. They can cause you to believe that the person that is speaking has come from Elohim, but then you never believe the message. But they can also lead you astray, and they can cause you to believe in another name or another concept or another message. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. Why is it not possible to lead astray the chosen ones? Well, one, they're the chosen ones, and two, they understand his name. So when somebody who is a false prophet or a false messiah comes teaching another name, they're not going to get it. Okay? They will not know his voice. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3 talks about the sort of things that Yeshua is referring to. When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, false prophet like Yeshua said, and he shall give you a sign or wonder, and the sign or the wonder shall come true of which he has spoken to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and serve them. Do not listen to the words of that prophet. Okay? Notice the message that the prophet comes with. Let us go after other gods. Do not listen to his words. Do not believe his message. For Yehovah your Elohim is trying you to know whether you love Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. How? Do you know his name? Do you love his name? If you love him, you will guard his commandments. So this person comes along with signs and wonders, which might be a temptation to lead you astray, but their message is not correct, and they're trying to lead you away from Yehovah's name. So in doing this, in allowing this, Yehovah is testing you to know whether you actually love his name and believe in his name. Revelation 13, 11 to 14 says, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So this is the false prophet. He does great signs so that he, makes, uh, he even makes fire come down from the heaven on the earth before men. And he leads astray those dwelling on the earth 
death because of those signs which he was given to do before the beast. So he speaks like a dragon, but he's doing these signs, okay? He looks like a lamb, he speaks like a dragon, and he's doing these signs, and these signs, which he does in the presence of the first beast, lead astray those dwelling on the earth which he was given to do before the beast, okay? And he makes them worship the beast. We hear about who this person is. It's revealed in, well, who this entity is in Revelation 19, 19 to 20. And I saw the beast, that's the first beast, the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to fight him who sat on the horse and his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet, that's the second beast that comes up out of the earth, who works signs in his presence. This is the description we were just given. By which he led astray those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. This is the second beast. But what's he doing? He's coming and he's speaking like a dragon. He's doing these signs and the people are going after the signs because they like the message which is accompanying it. Revelation 16, 13 to 14 says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons doing signs which go out to the kings of the entire world to gather them to the battle of the great day of Yehovah the Almighty. So they gather, gather them to battle against Yehovah by going out from the mouth of the false prophet and doing these signs and drawing them all against Yehovah. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood, and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. So he comes with deceit, with unrighteousness, because... Th- the reason that he's there is to lead astray those who have not received the love of the truth that they might be saved, the love of his name. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood. Okay, Elohim is in the business of doing this. False prophets, they test the hearts of the people that they'll see. Do you really love Yehovah? The ones who have not received the love of the truth in order for them to be saved, Elohim allows to be deceived in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth, did not believe in his name, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. You're either going to delight in who Yehovah is or you're going to delight in unrighteousness. And these signs and wonders accompany this to lead them astray. So the very last thing that I'm going to cover, and you've been very patient to sit through this, but Yehovah also looks for signs from us. In Genesis 9, 12 to 13, it says, And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and between every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So this is a sign that only Yehovah is doing. Obviously, we can't do anything to do with the rainbow, Yehovah, put it there. This is a sign of the covenant. Romans 4, 9 to 12, it says, Is this blessing then upon the circumcised only, or also upon the uncircumcised? That is, that belief should be accounted as righteousness. For we affirm belief was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? Was it when he was circumcised or when he was not circumcised? Well, this blessing was reckoned to him when he was not circumcised. And he received the sign, same word, the sign of circumcision, which was a seal, okay, like when you put a seal of approval on something, of the righteousness of the belief that he had while he wasn't circumcised. So his belief saved him when he was not circumcised. But he received this sign, which is a sign between him and the creator of the covenant, 
for him to be a father of all those believing through uncircumcision, for righteousness to be reckoned to them also. So we can be found in uncircumcision when we come to believe in Elohim. He becomes to us the father of circumcision to those who are not only of those who are circumcised, meaning the Jews, the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the belief which our father Abraham had in uncircumcision. What were the steps of those of the belief? Well, he became circumcised circumcised as the seal of the righteousness that he had by faith and he received this sign and this is why it's called the sign this is my covenant which you got between me and you and your seed after you every male child among you is to be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you so he makes a covenant he puts a rainbow there that's a sign from him to us we get circumcised and that's a sign from us to him it's a very special thing that we can do okay it's with Abraham between Yehovah and Abraham and Abraham's seed Galatians 3.29 if you're of Messiah then you are the seed of Abraham Paul tells us this just after telling us that we're saved by the Abrahamic Abrahamic covenant Abrahamic covenant Ezekiel 20 verse 12 I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me to know that I am Yehovah who sets them apart so we've had the sign from Yehovah to us we've got a sign from us to Yehovah and now we've got the Sabbath which is a sign between us it's a sign from Yehovah that we're set apart to him and it's a sign from us to Yehovah that we are set apart to him so as I say Yehovah looks for signs from us too